is. And um, that's the kind there's of person about, Richard is. There's about 20 or 30 on there now on YouTube. People send in translations. It's, it's remarkable. Incredible, incredible. <coughs> very powerful, very emotional. Uh, watch it afterwards. Remember to save your chat. Watch it later. It's really well done. And I'm going to turn this over to Richard because I don't want to take up too much more time. We're running a little behind because I've been a little too verbiage. I'll talk quickly. No, 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 no. You'll be fine. Okay. So everybody else is on mute. I'm going to spotlight All right. Richard. So I am giving you Richard Saunders, who did speak to us last year at Skeptic Camp. So. All right. Now, just it. give me a moment now. <clears throat> I'll see if I can share my screen. Are you seeing that? Yes, we are. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. So I, I can't see what you're seeing. Presumably you're seeing the first slide of my screen and me. Is that right? That is correct. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Susan. What a, what a wonderful thing it is to uh, speak once again for the Monterey Skeptic Camp. I was there last year in person. It seems like 20 years ago that I was actually physically there and I gave a talk about weird and wonderful investigations I've been doing over the years. This talk is going to be an overview of what it's like to put together a skeptical podcast, but you can relate this to any topic, any podcast you want to, uh, you want to do. And later on, if we have time, we might even do a little bit of the skeptic zone podcast. Now, here we go. Quick, a quick overview, just a quick overview. I'm all those things. I mean, uh, I have to write them down sometimes. I just do, I'd like to do lots of things. I like to have a varied existence, so to speak. So I've been with the Australian Skeptics for many years. I'm a fellow for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. I was involved with James Randi's uh, challenge for many years, TV and other investigations. And as uh, Susan said, I did a documentary some years ago called The Vaccination Chronicles. And that's a lovely, a wonderful uh, caricature of me done by Celestia Ward from Squaring the Strange. She's just a brilliant, brilliant artist, as you can see. So the Skeptic Zone podcast has been in production since 2008. And I just put out yesterday episode 638. And it is a weekly show. So every week without fail, no matter where I am in the world, no matter what I'm doing, a show comes out. They vary in length between 45 minutes and sometimes an hour, an hour, 10, something like that. But it's important that I, I'm consistent. Before 2008, I did about 20 other podcast type shows when I was just cutting my teeth, learning how to do all this. And there were various formats. And one was even a video show I did for about 12 episodes, but that was very difficult work. That was like doing a TV production every week. This current format, I think, is the best format. So let's talk about format. When you're considering doing a podcast, which I was in 2008 for this current thing, The Skeptic Zone, I decided very early on that the show would be a magazine style. In other words, definite segments. You could listen to a segment, come back later, listen to the next segment. The whole show wasn't really connected in that sense. Other shows also are similar. The SGU is a different style of show altogether, but they do have definite sections within their show, science or fiction, for example, in interviews sometimes, and they have each of the rogues give reports. Squaring the Strange, the ESP, and uh, Skeptics with a K also have different topics and segments. But I think the Skeptic Zone is a little different where the segments are completely and utterly separate from each other. Uh, and we have reporters, we have many reporters over the years doing their different segments. Some podcasts are more or less focused on a specific topic. The classic would be Skeptoid with Brian Dunning, where every week it's a short show, but it's very um, concise, covering one topic and one co topic very well. The Data Skeptic podcast also doesn't cover many, many topics in, in one episode. Then we have a chat style. Now, again, the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, where they all talk again with each other about all the topics, Squaring the Strange, the ESP, Ono, Ross and Kerry, Skeptics with a K and Rationable, are more about chatting and talking and talking and chatting about the topics. We have <clears throat> podcasts that can go out on location. The Skeptic Zone, well, until 2020, 
was famous for going out and doing live reports. Here I am standing on the street and here comes the psychic or whatever it is. I'm in, near this march with the anti-vaxxers and they're saying this. And uh, owner Ross and Kerry certainly do uh, go out into the public and to locations and do reports like that. But again, this year, this year, the last year, 2020 was completely different. But until then, we'd regularly have reporters or I, I would go out myself with my microphone or one of my microphones and do live on the street sort of uh, reports. And then interviews. Some podcasts heavily feature interviews. I do many interviews myself. My reporters do many interviews. But to one degree or, or another, most other podcasts will have uh, interviews too. That last word there should be rationable. <laughs> that's, um, that's not how you spell rationable. That's the Indian podcast with Abhijit. Now, how do you fill up the content? It's no good having a great idea. I'll have a magazine style podcast with segments. All right, you've got to fill it up with something. Interviews are a wonderful way to fill up content when you've got an hour to fill. And most weeks on the Skeptic Zone, most weeks there will be an interview with somebody. It's usually Susan Gerbeck lately, I think. I think I'll have to give her her own show actually, the Susan Gerbeck Hour with Susan Gerbeck. Yeah, I'll just retire, let Susan do that. So how do you do to do that? Well, I love doing interviews in person. Again, due to COVID-19, it's been very difficult. But until 2020, I would regularly do interviews in person where I'd go somewhere and interview somebody. Failing that, there's always online, and we'll get to that soon, uh, which is a, the most uh, common way we do it now. Uh, but uh, you can also use the, the old fashioned telephone. and you know, over the years, I've done many interviews ringing up people on the phone. And that works. You can make that work. You have general reports. What's happening in skepticism this week? What's the update to what was happening three weeks ago? What's the latest news? And that's just a matter of sitting there and trawling through the news, looking at Facebook for tips and uh, links, looking at the, the daily news to see if something's coming up. I've discovered that uh, historical items from Trove, which is the online resource from the Australian government, digitized newspapers, is a wealth of information. And I've had a wonderful series lately going back through history, looking at references to psychics or ESP or the Widgee board from history. What were reporters reporting on at the time? A couple of weeks ago, I did a very interesting segment on Yuri Geller from 1970s. 1972, 1973, see what they were saying about Geller at the time and relating it to what we know now. Uh, then with well, the Skeptic Zone, of course, we have reporters with their own special segments. We've had met for many years, my friend Maynard running around. His, his area of expertise is interviews. He's one of the best interviewers I've ever met. We have people like uh, Michelle Biggersma, who I know is watching at the moment, who came on at the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, to do a regular segment on logical fallacies. And that's her, her segment. It's quite distinct from everybody else. We've got the diet skeptic, Mandy Lee Noble. I'm gonna forget many people, and I'm sorry about that. We have Heidi Robinson on the north coast of New South Wales, my state, talking about mainly vaccination issues and on and on. Uh, you can all see those reporters at the Skeptic Zone website. and. Lately, uh, over the last year, over 2020, I've been introducing something that gives me a bit of creative outlet, which is just funny sketches. Susan Gerbeck was involved in one where she was a tour guide in the Bermuda Triangle. And I went on a trip and came back 14 times as different people from different time zones. It got very confusing, but it was, it was a lot of fun to do. And I've had lots of friends uh, recently uh, help me with that. I've just written a new one which I hope to have in production in a couple of weeks where Maynard and I run and run and ring up astrology service. That's just a bit of fun. People seem to have a laugh and a giggle over those, but it's just a bit of creativity for me. And it adds variety to the show, I think. Here are most of the microphones I've used over the last decade or so in production of the Skeptic Zone podcast. I go through them. As Susan Gerbeck knows, every two years I'm buying this great new wonderful microphone. All of those microphones I've used in the production of the show 
and I'll get to microphones in a minute. And they've all got their pluses and their minuses, and uh, I've enjoyed using them all. This one, however, I use surprisingly often. It's a phone. Your smartphone can act as a perfectly good field microphone or a microphone if you don't happen to have one. What I've done, as you can see there, is I've put on one of these things, a, a popping shield, which stops the pa, 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 plosives, they call it. And I run a program, uh, an app on my phone called Ferrite. And that's available for iPhone. I can't remember if it's available for Android, but there are many apps you can use, even the phone's own voice recorder. And you'll be surprised how good a recording you can get just by using your phone. It takes practice. You've got to know where to put it in relation to your mouth. The closer, the better, but not too close. Uh, but that's a great tip for anybody. And those little popping shields are very cheap on eBay. I buy them by the, the, the uh, bag full. And I often give them to people and say, here, use this. It'll make your recordings a lot better. So don't, uh, don't think you can't do a podcast or wonder how you're going to record. Most of you will have the equipment right in the palm of your hand. This is what I mostly use in my little studio, which is this room here, which is a Rode NT1A, which is a very good studio microphone. I'll take the cover off. There it is, naked, so to speak. And it's got a large diaphragm, and it has what they call a very low or non-existent noise floor. Now, when you turn on a microphone and make a recording, and you listen to it back, you can often hear a weird sort of odd static noise, you can't quite place it. That's just the fact that most microphones will produce that. This microphone has been designed so when you stop speaking, it should be absolutely silent, which for recording and editing is just wonderful. And this microphone is being fed even right now into that device, which is another microphone and mixer called the Zoom H6 Handy Recorder. Uh, because this microphone uses phantom power, so it's being powered by that recorder, which is in turn being plugged into the wall. So, I mean, when I started doing podcasting, I was using completely different equipment, but as things evolved, I, I just upgraded and upgraded. Now, I wouldn't recommend if you're starting a podcast that you run out and buy all this stuff I use, uh, because you might not like doing a podcast after three weeks. Lots of people give up, but that's the current system, uh, system I'm using right here in the studio. Now I spoke about doing online interviews and this is a little diagram I put together some time ago to show some friends who were interested in doing the same thing. And as you can see, it gets a little bit complicated, but as long as you, you, you follow these sort of instructions and you've got similar equipment, you can do interviews on iPad, on the telephone or whatever it is. In this case, I use the iPhone or the iPad to either ring somebody or hook up using Skype or Facebook Messenger or Zoom or whatever it is. When they speak, their audio is going out of the phone into the recorder there on the right. My voice is going into the same recorder on a different channel using this microphone. I can hear me and them via the headphones coming out of the recorder and they can hear me via the microphone on the phone or iPad. Now, if, if you've never seen anything like that before, it just looks like a, some sort of crazy uh, diagram, but some of you will, will get it. We'll see how that, uh, that happens. And uh, that just came about through trial and error over years, plugging things in, trying this, trying that. And most of the interviews you hear on the Skeptic Zone when I'm saying, and now joining me on the line, it's Susan Gerbeck or whatever, it's a similar system to what you see there. I've got hooked up behind the scenes in order for me to conduct that interview. And the good thing about this system is that my voice ends up on one track and my subject in, uh, in, uh, ends up on another track, which makes it good for editing and mixing. Speaking of which, one of the things that I did very early on in the skeptic zone was I wanted to have Mm, hooks, tags, I think they call them hooks in song lines, something like that. When you hear a bit of music, you know what's coming. 
and long-time listeners to the Skeptic Zone know when a, a new segment it comes along and there's they're a reporter, they know they have their own theme tune. And this sets up something in the mind of the listener of expectation, of comfort, of uh, knowing what's going to happen. Here comes an old friend I've listened to for years. I know that because here's the music. TV shows, and then going back even further, radio shows have known about this for years. That's why TV shows have distinctive theme tunes. It puts you in the mood. It puts you in the frame of mind. You know what's happening. It's comforting. And I use uh, on the iPad and the iPhone the free app, if you have those devices, GarageBand, it's worth learning. That, for example, is the theme tune I play for Logical Fallacies with Michelle Bickersma. Uh, and those who listen to the show know that tune. And uh, it took me about, oh, I don't know, a week to write that, put that together, mix it around and experiment with that before I was happy with that. But it may also means that all the music you hear on the show, or 99% of it, is mine. That means I don't have to worry about copyright. It's my stuff. If, if I need a new bit of incidental music for something, I simply sit down on my iPad an hour later, I've got, or half an hour later, depending, I've got an original bit of music, which is great for background music. So that's, that's wonderful. I don't have to look for it. I don't have to worry about, am I infringing copyright? Who do I have to pay? I can put it together myself. Speaking of putting it together, that program I mentioned before, Ferrite, on the iPad, pad and the iPhone is the app I personally use now to edit the whole show. And there we can see a, a show from some weeks ago, sort of half in edit, where we have a segment leading into another segment. I can bring the levels up and down. I can fade things. I can edit it to get rid of ums and ahs, which is usually a good thing to do because some people do um and ah a lot or I can make the uh, sound a bit pleasant. I can put in special effects, all that. The whole show comes together on my iPad every week. It used to come together on the PC using programs like Audacity, which are still wonderful programs and I recommend them. Audacity is free and lots of podcasters use it, but I happen to use this one called Ferrite and it's just what you know, which means if I'm sitting anywhere and I used to do this on long flights when I used to go and visit Susan Gerbeck or whatever in, in uh, California. I would just have my iPad and I could work on the show. I could do the uh, write scripts. I could do the editing, everything. It's just wonderful. So my recommendations. Uh, if you're wanting to start out a podcast, I would certainly re recommend Audacity if you're using a PC or Mac. It's free and there are many video lessons. Video lessons on YouTube are wonderful. You don't know how to use an app, go to YouTube. Somebody will teach you. For the iPad and the iPhone, I use Ferrite. Again, if you want to use that, there are free lessons available. And the basic version of Ferrite is free. It'll get you by. It'll, you can do a lot with it. And then if you get more serious, then you pay, I don't know, not very much, maybe $30 or $40 for the full-blown version. I recommend GarageBand if you need your own quick incidental music and you don't have to worry about copyright. And it's a lot of fun too. Microphones to get started, just use your iPhone, practice holding it, listen back carefully. And then if you get more serious, I would probably start at $100 up. Um, it's not, it won't do you any good to buy cheap microphones. You, you get sick of them, you'll hear the difference. It, it'll, 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 mean you're not as uh, polished as you can be. There's my uh, note about smartphones or the popping shield. Headphones, headphones. It's really important. If you're recording, if you can, which I'm doing now, you listen to your own voice. You might not like your own voice, but you must listen to it. It to catch errors you are making, to catch if you're getting too far away from the microphone and you don't sound any good very important you listen if you can while you're recording you certainly have to listen to what you've just recorded back shut your eyes and listen carefully and sound dampening now at the moment i haven't got all the setup i normally have in this room when i'm recording there's lots of hard surfaces here but a lot of people make the mistake of setting up a microphone on a table i don't know maybe three or four feet away from them in a room with hard surfaces walls 
and it just the echo really hurts podcasts if you listen to some podcasts all you can hear is the, the noise the echo of your own or, or the presenter's voice bouncing around tables and chairs and walls and things like that if you can what what makes a wonderful difference is you put up dampening things on the walls like like uh, old towels on picture frames and things like that it makes a huge difference very worthwhile and you can look that up on youtube too how to lessen noises other recommendations other recommendations is you practice you practice talking again you might not like the sound of your own voice but the more you speak into a microphone the better you get it becomes intuitive you do a lot of editing if you've got a long interview and this can take hours and hours if i interview somebody for 40 minutes and i need to cut it down to 25 you have to listen to it three or four times and then start cutting out bits which you can cut out um, as they say less is more the tighter your interviews are the better know when your voice is at its best right now my voice isn't sparkling as i had hoped for this but you know that's just the way it goes normally i like to start recording segments for the show certainly before six o'clock in the morning when my voice is at its best and lately i've had to do it at four o'clock because for some reason i've got lots of wild birds flying around and they start at five o'clock in the morning so i've got to get up really early to beat the birds so some of the segments of the show you hear with me going well look at this it's it's done at four o'clock in the morning if you're interviewing somebody do your research about the topic it's very important and remember that the interview is a chat it's a conversation with you and the person you're interviewing and the more you can make that like a friendly interesting chat the better it is for the listener that is if you're not doing a completely different style to what I do and you're uh, trying to really get information out of a person or you're being a bit aggressive. Great advice given to me by an old friend, Jim Wilshire. Now, those of you who listen to the show, when the show starts, there's a voice that says, welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for Science and Reason. That's an old friend of mine called Jim Wilshire, who was a big radio star back in the 80s in Australia. And he gave me a great bit of advice. He said, ad lib as if you were reading and read as if you were ad libbing. And the more you think about that, the more that makes sense. It's wonderful advice. In other words, if you have to ad lib, don't make it sound like you're struggling. You like you don't know what you're talking about, like you're trying to find something, you're uncertain. It's almost like you're reading a funny script. But if you were if you're reading something, don't make it just dry like this is an interesting story you try to animate it like like you're again like you're not reading like it's just flowing from you it's a tricky thing but it, it's great advice try to play it safe don't invite legal problems uh really don't invite legal problems it's just largely not worth it, it it's so it, it can cause so much trouble so i'm quite careful with the skeptic zone i skate a bit on thin ice from time to time but i just don't want to invite lawsuits and things like that and personally i use the libsyn hosting service which means when i upload it it distributes it to many things like itunes and youtube and things like that uh i get well that's the, the thing i said before about theme music uh, I, that's something i do you if you want to start a podcast you might not have any interest in that that's fine it's just something i do uh, knowing your topic is, is very important, especially when conducting interviews. And just generally speaking, if you have a podcast on something, say it's uh, feeding pussycats, well, know what you're talking about. It really helps. And try to remember that you're going to be listened to in somebody's ears. They're by themselves, usually. They're walking the dog. It's just you and them. And they have a relationship with you and you're... You're going to become their friend if they listen to you again and again. That's very important to remember. So keep that in the back of your mind. And dedication. You have to be dedicated if you want a successful podcast and it comes out every week, then make sure it comes out every week. A lot of podcasts start and run out of puff two, three, four months down the track. They get further apart. They used to be weekly or suddenly they're every second week which is fine and some can do that for years and then they'll be every month and then 
people lose interest. But there's the real team behind the Skeptic Zone, I must say. There's the editorial, the recording, and the board of directors right here at the Skeptic Zone studios. Thank you, everybody. Terrific, terrific, terrific. I just have to figure out how to unshare my screen now. Oh, that's fine. We'll just stare at the Skeptic Zone podcast link forever. That was <laughs> terrific. I haven't heard you do that talk before, and I have a lot of questions for you. And let's we'll see if other people have questions for you, but I'm going to ignore them at the moment while I while I ask you some questions. Let me. Anything I do. Okay, so there's a couple things that I really wanted to know. Let's talk about the cats. <laughs> and let's talk about the. I mean, you had Fred before that. Yeah. And um, I. Also, the things you do, like running downstairs, yes, different stuff like that. that. That's not in there just because. No, I run downstairs. It's no, downstairs. well, I know, I know you do actually run downstairs and try to keep from tripping on the cats. I but, do. Um, those are in the podcast for reason. Yeah. And can you briefly talk about that? Yeah, it comes back to this thing I, I said before about having a relationship with your audience. And it wasn't in the original podcast. It was the original, you know, if you listen back eight, you know, 12, 13 years ago, it, it, you know, I was a bit more uptight. I didn't know exactly what I was doing. But quick, quite quickly, I, you just develop these little bits and pieces which become endearing somehow. And they sort of happen organically. I think one day when I was introducing the show, it just popped into my head, said, no, I'm just offer a bit of toast and I hope you enjoy the show. And now that's a regular thing. And people want to know every week, what is it? What, what is it? What am I going to get this week? And they send me suggestions. They say, have you tried this food? Can you run downstairs and get some a bologna sandwich or something like that? And the same thing at the end of the show with the Easter egg with the dice game. Or whatever. It might be something else. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that just happened one day because, I don't know, it just popped into my head. And now people hang out and listen to it and, try, and like you, try to beat the dice every week. <laughs> people send you dice. Or dice yes. rollers. Dice rollers, Gray yeah. And Adrian, yes. Adrian will be on next. And she, she sent you a die. My friend Greg Doray sent me this dice rolling machine. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? That is amazing. Marcos is saying um, in the chat that he, he once got all three numbers correct. And Kenny Biddle says he loves it too. And then Avi wants to see the five die that uh, Adrian Mill do. That was hilarious. There it is. Susan's number. I is. don't know why. I have no idea how I became the the person who's <laughs> the dice game, uh, the five, five, five. And actually, to be honest with you, my favorite number is not five. My favorite number. What? Is, nope. My favorite number is eight. And it's not on the, on the, um, on the die. My birthday is eight, eight whatever number Susan picked, but you can't roll an eight on a six-sided dice, so I... Yeah, but, no, but normally I use this one, you see? There it is. Oh, well, there you go. There you uh, go. Brian Hart uh, said on YouTube that uh, when you started out, Richard, tonight, today to say that um, you hope you'll be able to speak fast enough or whatever it was you said, he said, uh, well, if he dropped the accent, maybe we'd get done a lot faster. <laughs> Rocky. Crikey. And that was Crikey. another thing is that you've been able to, your, your accent is understandable. And well, and you know what, this is, this is, this is pretty important because I spent a lot of time, I, I used to live in Germany and before then I used to work in the backpacker industry in Australia. And I learned very quickly that if you speak quickly in a heavy Australian accent and you use slang, like, Oh, good. I have a go and Look, look, there's a guy down the back and down, you know, like that, which people do suddenly people aren't understanding you. Now, if I want as many people to understand me as who, who have a grasp of English, if I speak clearly and not fast and I avoid slang and terms like that, which people won't understand, then it it's, uh, gets me a lot further, I think. I think it broadens your audience. It, same yeah. with uh, swearing. Yeah, I, yeah, there's no very rare exceptions where it's appropriate they'll be swearing on the skeptic zone. Normally, every now and then you'll hear the term bullshit get through, but in context. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, no, it's a, it's a it's more or less a family show. Right. And I think that, again, these are conscious decisions you make at the yeah. beginning, because otherwise, like if you have a thick accent, then you're only going to go to a narrow world of people who can understand that accent. And then if you add in swearing on top of an accent that's very strong, 
that's yeah. it's narrowing it even further. So when you say you don't have a lot of listenership, somebody would say, I don't, I don't attract a lot of listeners. It's partly because you've narrowed yourself into a window of, uh, you know, partly, but, it, but, but you know, it's, it's, it's a free, it's a free thing. If people want to have a, an, a podcast that they've done themselves where they do do that, then good luck. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying I don't for these particular reasons. Right. Okay. We have a question from Michelle Franklin over in Humpty Doo. Hello, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. One of my DSOW editors. I have to mention that again. She and she's a, she's a wonderful reporter on the Skeptics. And yeah, she does participate in Skeptics. Anyway, uh, <laughs> she was mine first. Um, she wants to know how you deal with the skeptical burnout. How do you stay motivated? And this is a very important question. I have to deal with it to myself all the time. Um, how do you deal with I, do, I do get burned out. It doesn't stop me doing the show. Sometimes I don't want to hear about skeptical topics anymore. I'm sick to death of them. That doesn't last long. Um, if I ever get to that stage, I'll run downstairs, get a coffee, turn on an episode of um, Mysterious Mysteries with some person and laugh myself silly, and then I get motivated again. <laughs> no, I, no I, I do get burnt out from time to time, but it, it, there's so much here to keep my interest that uh, it doesn't last long. Um, I, I'm a strong, strong, strong believer, and I mentioned this earlier today, is that we've got to get these podcasts out in non-English to uh, to broaden our audience, there's so much to talk about in other in other places with other languages. Marco says that he uh, he's there in Monterey, Mexico, and he was ha asked if there was any advice to promote the podcast and get it to your ideal listener. His biggest struggle is that, and I'm saying, you know, we need more podcasts in Spanish. And everything. well, one of the, the philosophies of the Skeptic Zone from day one is I promote other podcasts. I do it freely and I do it often. I never think we're in competition. And so love that about you any, it's been anyone, anyone in the world who has a skeptical event or skeptical podcast, I will promote it. I do not feel it's taking away my audience or anything like that. It's, it's something we all should do, I think. And we love you for that. So Richard, um, how do you, what advice would you give yourself that you didn't, if you were to talk to Richard Saunders of the years ago, what advice would you give yourself about this podcast? Oh, I have no idea. Well, besides the um, microphone every couple months. I guess every couple I would, of years, that is not true. <laughs> every couple of weeks, well, I think sometimes. Um, I would probably have a word to myself about uh, just the recording setup and having proper sound going and listening to myself, which I really didn't do too much in the early days and not putting too much echo on things. <laughs> And not and not trying to, to, to tweak my voice in post production to make it sound really good, you know that. Um, but to be honest, not too much. I mean, you you just have to um, you just have to dis to discover these things. Uh, something else I was thinking about is that um, something you and Maynard do, and and Maynard is really a terrific interviewer, and um, I'm he's not the best. Yeah, that. he really is great, especially interviewing people who believe in the paranormal. He's so kind. He's so yeah. funny. He, he he really brings the hum, humanity out of people. He oh, he does. Yeah. He doesn't necessarily look like, you know, weirdo quaint cranks or anything like that. He makes them, you know, he has a laugh with them. I've been interviewed by him several times, even on a bus when we were in Sydney. That was yeah. hilarious. All uh, the kids are like, who is that? That guy's got a big microphone and she's we, answering. Um, like she's we missed that. It was hilarious. Uh, we miss that very much. And yes. it robs the, the skeptic zone of a lot of content that we haven't been able to interview people at conventions and things. Right. But what I was thinking of is one of the tasks, talents you and Maynard have that maybe not a lot of other people do have is the ability to really just go up to people and say, can you repeat that? You know, and just like, just uh, like. I have my microphone right here. Like you said, the iPhone, I've learned a lot from you. It's like, okay, here you go. Can you, I'm taking this over right now and I'm going to do a record segment. <laughs> I mean, that is not something that a lot of people are able to do where they're able, you know, they're timid about, oh, well, should I ask them if I could interview them? Yeah. Well, what Maynard is the master of that. I, I can do it, but I'm not as comfortable as Maynard. Maynard is just superbly comfortable. Walk up to anybody, here's the microphone. And then when, when, when you do that and you're engaging and people think they want to hear what I have to say, it, it makes a world of difference and they can often open up. It's good. And you've interviewed people just going through museums. Yep. Uh, 
you're you're just really good at finding the opportunity to get the inter, uh, to get the segment, even if it's just at a street fair or oh yeah, and it, yeah, that's it, why at the drop of a hat, if I if I think this might make an interesting interview or a sit or a report, I'll get my phone out and do it. Mm-hmm. Listen to it later. If it's good, I'll use it on the show. Background I remember noise. one of my happiest interviews was interviewing you at the airport in New Zealand. Remember that? That was fabulous. <laughs> yeah, fabulous. We had fun. Just all kinds of things. So I guess it depends on the person, personal style, you know, if they want to stay inside or if they, yeah. if, I don't know. Yeah. The magazine style uh, is, I find really interesting because Thank you. you can pick up on, you know, you're, you're at an aquarium or you're at, um, yeah you're out at the park and you see somebody yeah. doing something really interesting and you say, yeah. you walk up to him and say, I have a podcast and I'd like to, can I just ask you? Well, the, la- the last tip I would give to anybody doing field reports, let your audience in on the secret. By that, I mean, you introduce where you are. Well, here I am standing on the corner of the street. There's some buses going by. It's a nice day. And then you're, in- you're inviting people in to your space, they know where you are. So if they hear something weird, they're not saying, what, why am I hearing a seagull? What's going on? Is that a motorcycle? See, in their minds, yeah. they're walking on the beach with you. They're down the street. So all the atmospheric sounds you hear, which could be annoying and disruptive, suddenly become part of the scenery of your live report or interview. Absolutely. That's a good tip, I think. We feel like, uh, I think podcasters, I think this thing I hear most about people who are on podcasts is that they're, they're friends. Yeah, you know, you you become like a friend to them, and and talking about your cats or what you're going to eat, yeah. or you know how early in the day you got up or the weather, which you talk about a lot. I find that really interesting, <laughs> and comforting to know it, it's it's a feeling that I'm hanging out with a friend, and I'd like I to think that you and I are friends. So that would be, I think so. Well, good. folks, look, thank you very much again. But now it's time for me to run downstairs, and I think I'll have some chicken noodle soup while you enjoy the rest of Monterey Skeptic Camp. And that is exactly how it's done, folks. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you for agreeing to do this for us. I, I really appreciate it. I'm going to, uh, there are some um, interesting links in the show notes, and uh, the chat, show notes, oh my gosh. Uh, Rob Palmer put up an interview he did with you, and that's in the chat. So make sure everybody to um, get that out of the chat. Also, there's three little dots, as Rob has pointed out in the chat, that allows you to download the chat uh, links. So please do so and look at those later. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Okay, you guys, we're running a tiny bit behind, but that's not such a big deal. We, we've got some catch-up time in here elsewhere, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, that was really fun. And as I said, I think that we, we need to get more of this kind of content out there, especially in languages other than English. And I'm going to keep saying that again until I hear it from everybody who's starting it. And uh, Marco will talk later. <laughs> So we're going to talk right now about another really great uh, uh, person who's just come from um, rising up, so so to speak, somebody who I have only known for a very brief time. It's uh, GSOW, we talk about it a lot here in, in Skeptic Camp. We've been talking a lot about it, not necessarily so much because they're Wikipedia editors, which they are, and they, and they are contributing in a really remarkable way, but also because what happens when you become a Wikipedia editor or join the GSOW or the Gorilla Skeptic Project, which is totally different from the GSOW project, that's more that focuses on psychics, is that you're introduced to so many people, your world expands, not only in friendship-wise, but people who are also doing other things that you can join in and be involved in. And this person who's coming up next, Adrian Hill, is one of those people who she came into the GSOW project, which kind of spurred her on to to do